Welcome to my session. It's a true pleasure to be here at Cotisol 2020. Thank you very much to the conference organizers for the invitation and to make this conference happen despite the circumstances that we are living as a society. We all know that planning, designing, mapping, and following up a conference is not an easy task, but you certainly made it possible. I'm Dr. Liliana Cuesta Medina, representing Universidad de La Sabana, Colombia, and I'm here to share the voices from our ELT communities concerning the building of a research and writing culture. I really hope that you enjoy this session. And I'd like to start my talk with the metaphor of the bridges, what they represent, what they are for. The first picture that you see on the left side of your screen takes you to Puente del Común, a gorgeous architectural piece that carries out the traces of our independence and the battles that took place there. The other two bridges, the red one and the most modern one, are bridges that we have inside our campus. Each of these pictures depict ourselves as educators who share ideas, knowledge, connect with knowledge and with other people, despite the restrictions in time and location. I'm very happy to connect with other educators from the globe, joining and sharing the best of our world. I'm here to share some of the strategies that we have designed, implemented, and assessed in our master's programs concerning the development of research and academic writing. It's my intention to share with you the learner, the practitioner, the teacher trainer, and even the researcher about those practical ways that have worked for us to guide our learners and our research and language team members to conduct research and disseminate it through scholarly pieces. It's my intention to support educators and language learners to build a research and writing agenda that help you develop, sustain, and showcase the work that you develop in your educational institutions. Let me tell you a little bit of our context. Universidad de La Sabana is located in Colombia, in Chia, Colombia. Our university has more than 11,000 students, more than 9,000 students for undergraduate level, are at the undergraduate level, and more than 3,000 students at the graduate programs. In our ELT programs, we have trained more than 400 students, mostly from Colombia, although in the Masters in English Language Teaching, in the online version, we have had students in the past from Ecuador, the Philippines, United States, and Brazil. In my talk, I'm going to focus on two central areas. The first one, the challenges. The second one, the opportunities. Let's start with the challenges. In our previous research studies conducted with our student populations, we have found a series of problems and barriers. On the one hand, there are numerous barriers that students report concerning adaptation and skill development pra practices proper of the new learning environment, the graduate level environment. On the other hand, there is a scarcity and lack of exposure to the norms of the written rhetorical communication. And this is due to two causes, according to our research studies. First, our population academic writing difficulties are fundamentally non-linguistic. This result from the lack of familiarization either or their L1 and their L2 lack of exposure and familiarization with the rhetorical norms of ge relevant genres. And two, because they are trained or they have been trained in a culture that prioritizes language and style issues over the development of essential rhetorical production following specific norms. So, in other words, they prioritize issues such as tone, syntax, semantics, grammar, and vocabulary rather than on the function and on the form of the discourse as proper 
of the rhetorical elements that need to be present in an academic and a scholarly piece. We discuss in depth these problems in one of our publications, which we will be happy to refer at the end of the presentation. These difficulties can be pictured in this triangle, right? Argument reasons, argument sources, authorial voice, and argument structure. Our students possess serious limitations in managing these type of topics. This said, the rhetorical communicative competences are for us, and I say for us, my team, extremely important in a knowledge-driven society. We argue in our publications that learners must become critical consumers and producers of knowledge. And we also believe that teachers need to be able to train our learners in the acquisition development of these essential competences, which do not restrict to the classroom learning, but that they are essential to the lifelong learning possibilities. Area number two, opportunities. The diagram that you see right there depicts our proposal. And when I refer to our, it's because I'm referring to the work that I've developed with my team. Rhetorical communication, flip learning, quality professional development, all of these components lead us to the more equitable distribution of knowledge. Lead us also to believe and to experience broader access to global scholarly opportunities. All these together, put together and assembled together through our building of the research and writing pieces. The reason why I'm picturing and depicting this diagram now is because you will see throughout, hopefully throughout the talk, the connection and the underpinning principles that are ruling and framing our support choices, our scaffolding choices, our academic writing and research development pieces. All of this also lead us to foster elements such as self-regulation, agency with our learners. It also helps us to reconfigure traditional educational power structures in which the lecturer and the teacher possesses the knowledge. And this is a co-constructed um, experience an academic experience in which, although you scaffold the learner, the more the learner advances in the process, the more agency is developed in, by the learner and the more self-regulated the learner becomes. All of this also leads us to a lifelong learning experience. This said, in helping learners at all levels and ages become more critical consumers and producers of knowledge, thus create powerful opportunities for them and for their personal and communal success. Now, let's start presenting some of the things that have worked for us. In this table, we depict three main, three or four main strategies that we have developed and that I will have the time to talk a little bit about each one of them as we move on the talk. Traditional scaffolding activities, focus on authentic product, and the flipped approach are the three main underpinning areas uh, that we are going to refer now. Some of these have proven along the time and have had at the beginning, you know, limited gains, but little by little have proved effective. 
and that's the reason why I brought it for uh, this session. Let's just start with the first one, the citation workshops. We started training our students in the use of uh, our software uh, management systems. We started with Mendeley, we did use some of our students use EndNote, but now we have consolidated, uh, we have adopted Mendeley in our programs like the ruling uh, software reference management system. Training in these type of areas has been, you know, like difficult with our students. However, little by little, we have built the culture um, to cite properly, to co-construct, to create groups in which they share both their annotated bibliographies and that they also become more skillful in the selection of scholarly sources, books, journals, conference proceedings and they also team up with other individuals to do so. They have little by little, it hasn't been an easy task, but little by little they have adopted uh, that culture because at the beginning it was very, very difficult. They did have a hard time understanding APA, which is the format that we use mainly in Colombia, in Colombian educational institutions. Um, they had limitations in aping in using APA style uh, norms. Having said so, let's move on to the second strategy that we have implemented, and the, it is uh, concerning the the construction of the mentor texts. What we say the the text that we take as an example to model explicit behavior, and remember that the main a goal is to help students understand the discourses of the different academic genres. So we have used mentor texts to model students' way to analyze tests, and not only tests, but the discourses um, embedded in this type of text. So we have moved along uh, lexical issues, discourse analysis issues, and even um, in issues concerning the form and the layout of these scholarly pieces. So basically what we have done and we keep uh, on doing is to take samples of scholarly pieces. They could be pieces um, downloaded from databases or articles uh, published physically, we take them to the classroom um, and we uh, ask students to analyze the texts starting by the abstract, right? Uh, what you see on the screen is just a very basic analysis of an abstract, right? The analyzing issues such as the title, right, the rationale, and asking students to go actually to interact with the text and to find these elements in the text and compare and contrast with other peers and with the instructor responses as they deconstruct the mentor texts. So we little by little, and this is not a formulaic uh, situation, but we have also guided them little by little to be able to sit down and interact and work with the data and the input that they are receiving and this input coming from the many pieces that are available in the market now, in the scholarly market. So what you also see right there, uh, it's just a piece that it's commented, it's annotated. You see uh, the downside um, part of the screen, uh, the commentaries from uh, the instructor, the highlights uh, both from the instructor and the student, and it's a way in which they 
um, little by little gain awareness of the genre of the academic genre that we are managing and they are also familiarized with the discourse and with the lexicon that appears in each one of the articles or the scholarly pieces the third strategy let's move on on the third strategy that we have implemented and that has proved really effective it's the use of templates the use of templates to write things such as the biodata the abstract of a presentation that they have to deliver um, a template for the state of the art that they have to write right a template for the overall research report or the master thesis our students need to write a research report um, between um, 15,000 words and 17,000 words so by each one of the chapters we have um, standardized and we have created scaffolds that help students guide the writing of this process what you see on the screen is just a simple template that one of the faculty members created, Dr. Anderson, who's an expert in this building of uh, templates. Uh, and this was created to guide students to write effective state-of-the-art pieces. So as you see right there, complete the sentence below to summarize the state the state of the art for your project. So there is a first prompt that says previous studies have focused or have said that, and there is a space to write, and the other prompt uh, says, but they have not examined or considered or looked at, and then the students are supposed to complete the sentences as they move forward. Then, uh, together with the templates, we have had also the possibility to build a lot of self-assessment scaffolds. And these self-assessment scaffolds also prove effective to uh, compare them uh, when they are when students develop them with the expected standards that we have in our research pieces, in our scholarly pieces. So as you see, there are, there is there is some criterion. Right, and that as it is depicted on the screen, there are different versions, there are different drafts that are submitted, and each one of the drafts have a corresponding criteria to be assessed and corresponding number of points. We have also used templates to manage our meetings with students which we call in our programs, our consultation sessions. We created this form uh, to effectively manage the time that we were spending in consulting with students. So we have found over the time that these type of elements or scaffolds, as we may say, and also templates, as you could also picture it helps in planning and developing uh, managerial skills uh, by the side of the students it also saves our time uh, it facilitates the dialogue and it optimizes the time and the content of the meeting they are very easy to fill in and also for us as instructors it helps us and like in my case that I have a lot of students, it helps uh, me to follow up each one of the cases and be able to know where did I, you know, leave the case before and where do I pick it now. So it's easy. It's an easy way for uh, to retrieve information and also to follow up. It helps students develop self-assessment not only planning but self-assessment uh, practices as they really need to sit down and say okay what did i plan for this session 
this this consultation session that I have to meet with the instructor. What was my um, homework? What is what I have to do? How do I see my uh, project going? What am I missing? And these type of things. So in other words, it saves time for consultation and for tutorial time. I'll be talking about that in a minute. We have also learned additional lessons concerning the consultation sessions. We have learned that um, the feedback has been more valuable and has been more effective when we scaffold students and we help them to manage the feedback that they are given because they generally are not trained to manage the input and the feedback that they are giving and at the beginning we have tones or we have engaged in practices that demanded lots of time and effort um, by the instructors but when the feedback got to students they have limitations uh, to handle the feedback we have learned that scaffolding uh, could be breaking up a long time, right? Could be uh, a strategy that we use not only at a specific moment, but it has to be used sequentially. We have also learned that the sessions of feedback have to be effectively timed and restricted in purpose. And we have become better in the planning of task indicators, uh, sources, the use of sources and the selection of sources. And we have also uh, become more effective in the provision and the helping out uh, possibilities that we give to students so they can um, assess, develop and assess their writing opportunities. An additional strategy concerns the usage of flipped learning structures in our programs. Um, you see on the, on the left side of the screen, um, the screenshot of a live interaction that I was hosting with one of my students, my research students via Blackboard Collaborate. And although we all know that flipped approaches require significant investment in materials development, the videos that you have to create, uh, not only to replace or to blend the face-to-face -face cla uh, classroom, classroom input or lecturing, but also the creation of additional materials or the selection and curation of sources. Although we know that they demand time in planning, the delivery, the implementation, and the assessment stages prove more effective when flipped approaches are intertwined in the research classroom, in our opinion. So, speaking of using multi-model instruction and learning in a flipped approach for research and writing, we can conclude that it helps managing effectively instructional design and course implementation. It fosters academic skills like the ones that are depicted in the diagram. It also facilitates interaction engagement both in class and in students' autonomous practices which happen outside the classroom. And last but not least, encourages digital literacy development. Now, in these um, last minutes of my talk, I would like to direct your attention to the specific tasks that you could do in the research and writing classroom. It's my intention to remind you to think productively and to align your course products to the main course objective. And I have the metaphor also of a puzzle. It's putting the pieces of the puzzle together, but having a common goal. 
So these are some of the activities that you could do. One, you can ask students, I encourage them to get used to ask questions to the literature all the time, all the time. What does the literature say? What is my initial guiding question? What is what I want to do when I find this or this scholarly source? What does the literature tell me in regards to my research study? What is the gap that I intend to fill uh, when I design a study like this? Two, be practical in the instrument design phase. And this includes um, many things. On the one hand, analyzing pieces, instruments that other scholars have already validated and created. So I tell my students not to invent, to reinvent the wheel. Just have some models, perhaps adapt or write to the others to keep using these resources and to keep helping validating them. And also it includes the usage of web-based resources that are going to make their lives easier when they digitize and process the information. Um, issues such as um, um, resources such as Google Forms or any other web-based survey tools help them to collect information easily and to retrieve it also easily. Three, in data analysis stages, ask students to be familiar with the production of memos, right? You can uh, read Strauss and Corbin. They have a very nice definition and also examples of writing memos, mind maps, creating tables, conceptual and data analysis matrices conceptual matrices in which they write the conceptual definitions that are framing their research study, right? These are small pieces in which they are um, encouraged to use uh, this course, this course proper of their scholarly pieces and the genre that they are interacting with. They can also build infographics, abstracts, biodata, as I show you in a former slide and train them gradually into the writing of short papers a thousand word paper start with the abstract start with the biodata and progressively move forward to uh, longer pieces of text make them also as i said and this is the metaphor put the pieces of the puzzle together all products shall derive from the main objective of the research study and based um, on our experience from a research study our students are prompted and encouraged to um, design a minimum of three pieces uh, some of our students we have published with them and we have co-authored the articles right because that is another of the strategies that i will show you in a minute the mentoring in writing, academic writing, and the co-construction and the co-writing, um, they have created an article. They have also had the opportunity to go and disseminate uh, their studies in conferences. And they have also had the possibility to write mini papers and conference uh, proposals. So what is what we all uh, have done to disseminate the ideas of our students and of our research and writing um, processes. We have a focused on three principles, impact, pertinence, and doability. And we, what we do both in the research pieces and in the writing pieces is to suggest students to think of these three principles, but think of three specific communities depicted also in the diagram. We want students to think of their target educational institution, right, where they are conducting their research, but we are also fostering and telling them to think of the significance of their studies, not only for the target educational institution, but the local community and at a global sphere, at the global ELT communities. So we encourage them to 
think locally but also think globally. Concerning the dissemination ideas that you can, you know, develop with your students, you could host student research fairs with your populations, small in-house activities. You can call it a colloquium, a symposium. You could also encourage your students to submit presentation proposals to local or international events if this is the case. As I was referring before, you could co-author papers with them. You could train them progressively. We have had um, in our programs the experience with uh, of teachers and of uh, instructors and research advisors who have published and have developed a culture of publishing, of producing and publishing with their own students. Um, you could not only for those faculty members, because we know that a lot of faculty members or some faculty members may not be interested or may not have the time to co-author a paper, but they could co-author a presentation. They submit it together. This is good teamwork and this is good mentoring and scaffolding work that the students uh, value a lot and also the educational community, the institution and instructors as well. Finally, you could um, design and map research field trips to local events, right? Um, to educational events in which you go as the class uh, and uh, have that embedded in your schedule to train students and to um, optimize their professional development exposure because that's why we are talking about this it's to surpass the limitations of the limited exposure that the students have to this type of genres and this type of discourses towards the end of our session today um we want to we want to see happy students, you know, that um, receive their uh, diplomas, but that they have also acquired competences, the competences that you see in the work cloud, competences of autonomy, collaboration, self-efficacy, and they build gradually their confidence to present and to conduct research. These are some of our reference publications that I've been uh, citing throughout this short session. I'm happy to um, share them with you. And um, they are freely available in the databases and in the internet. And last but not least, it's been a very nice um, opportunity to talk to you. I know that the time is a little bit limiting, but uh, we have to keep it short and concise to develop and deliver the messages that we intend to deliver in this conference. Uh, so it's a real pleasure, as I said at the beginning, to have participated in this wonderful conference. And I'm here to share with you and to build more bridges among our educational worlds. Thank you very much. Um, much love from Colombia and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.